I'm very excited to have with us today, Stephanie uh, Rodriguez. She's a mental health therapist that has been practicing for over nine years and is the founder and lead therapist of Emergent Mental Health Services, a private practice in New York City. She received her master's degree in mental health counseling from Fordham University and works with children, adolescents, and adults struggling with mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and trauma. As a bilingual Spanish-speaking clinician, Stephanie is able to meet the needs of the community to ensure that language is not a barrier to receiving treatment. She utilizes her training in modalities such as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, acceptance and commitment therapy, and neurocounseling. Stephanie worked for a nonprofit organization as a school-based mental health therapist, where she provided therapy to students and families in grades three, uh, K through 12. Um, so um, at this point, I do want to turn it over to Stephanie Rodriguez to get us started. Um, I did see that our slides um, are off screen right now. So uh, just bear with us, folks, and we'll get the slides back up. Um, but I'm turning it over to, to Stephanie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Diana. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, as, as Diana mentioned, today we'll be talking about ways to support Latinx caregivers in speaking to teens to foster deeper connection. And happy National Minority Mental Health Month to you all. So before getting started, one thing I wanted to highlight today is that this year's theme for Mental Health America's Minority Mental Health Month is culture, community, and connection. And another theme for National Health Month, Minority Health Month in April, it was better health through better understanding. It seems very fitting that today we're talking about ways to foster deeper connection within not just the, of course, the Latinx culture is important to address, but also ways to honor the ways that community and connection are, are, are able to be together and, and can be impacting for families. So today's presentation will be focused on understanding the mental health stigma that continues to exist among the Latinx community. We'll have an overview of the teenage brain and learn neural counseling techniques to teach caregivers. We'll learn ways to engage with Latinx caregivers so that they can be a part of their team's treatment team and support improving their mental health so they can feel empowered to do so. And lastly, but also very important, we'll review self-care techniques for Latinx caregivers and providers of Latinx families. So now let's dive in to discuss the connection between Latinx family and mental health. So throughout the US, we can see that there are large numbers of individuals who are diagnosed with a mental health condition. According to NAMI, it has been reported that one in five U.S. adults experience mental illnesses each year. Among the mental health diagnoses, anxiety disorder is one of the most common mental health diagnoses that's been given. And throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen that adjustment disorder was another common diagnosis. As you can remember, having to adjust to such a difficult time uh, was something that was applied to all. Also, one in six U.S. youth aged six to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year, and 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by the age of 14 and 75 by the age of 24. Within Latinx youth, we can also see that there is a prevalence of mental health specifically to them. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA, over 18% of Latinx youth suffer from depression during their lifetime. 78% of Latinx youth suffer at least one ACE or adverse childhood experience, and 28% suffer four or more. If you're familiar with the ACEs study, you know that if, you, if one experiences at least one ACE, there's a higher chance of difficulties in their adulthood. And we see that 28% suffer four or more. And so that impacts them even more significantly. 73% of Caucasians diagnosed get treatment for depression compared to 63% of Latinx youth. 
And if we can see through the ACEs study, if there are individuals who are experiencing one or more, and if they're not getting any, uh, any treatment for it, we can see how we can only anticipate the difficulties that uh, it can bring for them as well. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted youth's mental health due to increased responsibility at home, poor academic performance, and decrease in socialization. Throughout the Latinx community, we also see how mental health has been, has impacted them. Mental health issues are on the rise for Latinx people between the ages of 12 to 49. One in four individuals who reported having a mental health condition were categorized as having a serious mental health condition. Between the years of 2015 and 2018, major depressive episodes also increased from 12.6 to 15.1 in Latinx Hispanic youth between the ages of 12 to 17, from eight to 12 in young adults ages 18 to 25, and 4.5 to 6% in the ages of 26 to 49. And so we can also anticipate that between 2018 till today, you can, you can imagine those numbers have also increased. Also, we want to highlight the impact of suicide. It is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 to 14 and 20 to 34 in the US. And in 2019, suicide was the second leading cause of death for Latinx Hispanic individuals between the ages of 15 to 34. So I wanna hear from you. In thinking about your work, if you can use the chat option, what are some barriers that you can anticipate uh, in participating in mental health services for Latinx caregivers? You can take a moment to hear your responses. Yes, thank you. Language barriers, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fear, yes, absolutely. Stigma. Thank you. Very limited time due to basic meeting basic needs. Yes, understanding what mental health is. Caregiver availability, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you very much for sharing everyone. The fact that teens will express depression but the parents or caregiver negates that it, it even exists, really minimizing what may be going on for them. You might hear the parents say that's not as important anymore or it's not important at all. Think about these other things that are going on. Focus on your school, focus on things that are important. Cultural standards and interpretations to mental illness. Yes, absolutely. Have there been any strategies that have worked for any of you? Anything that you can share? Mm, translation services, yep, absolutely. Keeping parents involved, yes, definitely. And we'll definitely get into that as well. Psychoeducation and support groups, yes, absolutely. Mental health treatment, parent education. Being Latinx, yes, and able to relate to those cultural barriers. Being a peer advocate, being able to tell my family's challenges, sure, so some, some appropriate disclosure, highlighting the importance of parents' involvement, yes, absolutely. Letting them know you can come in and, and you can be a part of this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, a value. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, acknowledging that there could be the parents or caregivers will have their own opinions or even refusal around engaging at times, so respecting that but also of course like trying as best to involve them whenever appropriate, whenever it's needed. Understanding before being understood. 
So thank you all. Yes, peer-to-peer -peer support. Definitely being able to utilize the parent to help them, invite them into being a part of their treatment team, sharing, you know, anything that could feel appropriate to share, giving them psychoeducation, letting them know that they that they are very crucial in being a part of the team that, you know, within this is a collectivist culture, you know, we're not doing this all alone. And so being able to utilize the, the parents or caregivers using community support and letting them know that when appropriate, you're on their side and you want them to be uh, involved. Thank you everyone for sharing. So yes, as we've mentioned in the chat, uh, lots of different barriers uh, that parents and caregivers experience. So language, absolutely. Being able to find a provider who understands the native language, any nuances, that at times can be really hard. Or if you, you know, you are a provider who speaks uh, bilingual uh, Spanish and, you know, being able to juggle that as well. And sometimes you may be the only uh, bilingual speaking uh, clinician in, in your team and what that means for you as a provider as well. Then there's poverty, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, it poses a higher risk for mental illness and it limits the access of, of receiving help. The Latinx community that's living below the poverty level are twice as likely to report psychological distress. We can see how that also impacts their access to, to mental health and there is a higher need as well. Insurance, 20% are uninsured and have fewer options. The Census Bureau reported the Latinx individuals had among the highest uninsured rates in the nation. So that means that they're also less likely to receive care. Immigration status is also something that we see. We work with families from other countries. And so there's also the, the feelings of being afraid of a deportation or any separation from family. Acculturation. So working towards embracing the culture that they or the, of the place that they live in, but then also fearing discrimination. And as we've mentioned as well, there's the stigma, valuing the privacy, families may not feel comfortable in, in talking openly about what's going on in their personal life and as, and as well as their mental health. These inequalities, as we've discussed, really puts these uh, the communities at higher risk, unfortunately, and it could be more severe for them and in their mental health conditions. And without treatment, as we discussed a few slides ago, that their, their mental health conditions can also worsen. There is a cultural phenomenon that uh, Latinx uh, community uses called familismo. It is a cultural foundation that emphasizes connectedness and a strong attachment and duty to one's family. So if you are think thinking about your family wanting to, of course, uh, be able to respect what you are, whatever messages are being told, then of course you're and if you're hearing that you don't need to talk to someone else or a therapist about your problems, then you're, like, you're less likely to be encouraged to do so. So this idea that we don't tell our business or we keep things within the family, uh, that of course can only continue to perpetuate the stigma. There's also the thoughts that uh, those that go to therapy are considered loco, loca, or crazy. And those who do go, they need to be on medication. And we know that that is certainly not the case. And then there's also those who might be refusing to take medication and opt to take natural remedies. And while of course that can be helpful, uh, there are times where medication could be deemed appropriate. And as we've talked about as well, providing education, psychoeducation to caregivers about treatment options can be helpful in destigmatizing, letting them know, educating them on the different types of providers that are available and different kinds of treatment options. So if this is uh, maybe more so individual therapy that can be, uh, can be best, or perhaps it's a support group, or perhaps it's, it's all of the above if it's appropriate within the clinic or setting that you work in where there could be 
individual, group, family therapy, and or medication management. Including the caregiver in the conversations is also very important whenever that is appropriate. So that could be via parent or family sessions and or phone call check-ins as well with the parent or caregiver. So what are some warning signs that caregivers should know about? So we see here this loss of interest in things that they enjoyed, irritability, stomach aches or headaches, perhaps there's change in school performance, low energy, maybe fear of gaining weight, substance abuse, increased isolation or withdrawing from friends, any self-harming behavior, whether it's non-suicidal, self-injury, or to engage in suicide, engaging in risky behavior at school or at home, any changes in hygiene, perhaps they're not showering as much or uh, not taking care of themselves, any difficulties organizing their thoughts and speech or thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves or others. So now we'll further review a few key facts about the teenage brain and ways to help parents further understand them. During the adolescent years, it is an important time for brain development. The biggest skills being worked on are executive function and self-regulation, two of the challenging parts that we see with work and when uh, parents are sharing uh, their concerns or challenges with their teens. Executive function helps with planning, organizing, judgment, making better decisions, organizing themselves, um, and of course, self-regulation, being able to regulate their emotions, which are really high during the adolescent years. Socialization is also a crucial uh, part of their lives during this time, and that also helps with further developing their brain. However, because their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, it's the part right behind your forehead that allows for the executive functioning and self-regulation. It's, it's chances are that they are likely to have really uh, poor impulse control and executive functioning skills. So here, here goes in the, the frustration that parents may often be sharing with you about or you hear about. Unfortunately, long-term negative impacts on brain development and mental health include chronic neglect, caregiver substance abuse, or poor mental health, exposure to domestic violence, and family economic hardship. These are part of the ACEs as well that we talked about earlier that we find that teen, like, uh, teen, Latinx teen experience. The teen brain may respond differently to stress. There's a lot going on for them at this time. And if you add in as well, a different hormonal changes, which is of course, developmentally appropriate, you can see that their stress tolerance can vary. And of course, their, teen, their brains are significantly different than adult brains. You can also remind parents that memory is also affected during these ages. So they'll forget things very often. Grace is necessary with teens. I often have to remind parents about, about this because it's, it's during these times that things are frustrating, but it's also not much that they can do, unfortunately, but there is hope that things can change and shift for them. A brain more fitting for adulthood is forming. I remind parents often that this doesn't excuse their behaviors, but it helps provide an understanding and perhaps even answer the question that parents may have to their for their child is, what were you thinking? So oftentimes we can remind parents that sometimes it may not be that they're thinking, they are, they are managing so much at this time and it, there, there could be hope with more time, more grace and patience. Here's an activity that I like to share with caregivers and parents. I would provide them with this blank drawing of a brain and ask them to draw and fill out what they think their teenager is prioritizing and how much. 
and that there's no right or wrong answer. This is just something that we can explore together to help them share with us how they understand their child's brain, and then we can provide them with more information on what is happening. So we're sharing the attachment here so that you can have with you. And then I show them this, the average teenage brain. So it provides an understanding, you know, it's, it's a bit comical, you know, that you can see different things, uh, how things are different. We can compare what the parents think in the, in the blank um, worksheet of the brain and what may actually be the reality of their teen, what they're going through. What do you notice about this image here of the brain, of the average teenage brain? What might you notice takes up most space or takes up the least amount of space? Yep, large preoccupation with love. Yes, judgment is very small. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right, there's definitely a lot going on here. There's a lot going on in their brains. There are a lot that they're juggling and it's all important to them. Even though the adult might say, this is not important, you should focus on something else that seems more important in the adult brain. Yeah, busy. Yes, the yin and yang, love and hate towards parents. Memory, yep, memory for chores. And as you mentioned earlier, memory is impacted and it's, it's, they're often forgetful. Communication skills, right? There's, it, they're not able to oftentimes communicate effectively what they're feeling, but they'll express it. The emotions will definitely come out. I think it's interesting to see also the rebellion center, something that is also common among adolescents. And we see also self-image, how that could be, it's, it's a part of their, like, their development. Some may, you might find that they may be struggling with their self-image and they may, and it's, you see that it's also small at times these teenagers could struggle with their self-image. Yes, communication via eye rolls and bombastic side eyes, absolutely more of the physical ways of communicating versus verbal. Also, although we may see verbal, but it, it may also come in with a lot of emotions too. But all of this is, is definitely common. It's typical to have teenagers fluctuate with their moods and struggle with a lot of this busyness. This, we see a lot that's going on for them at this time. Yes, the addiction section, absolutely. Addiction to, it says Facebook here, but I wanna also add there's, there's Instagram, there's TikTok, and there's you know, all these like the latest uh, social media application, but, but yes, definitely the cell phone. We might also find them, there's addiction to video games, like that reward center of the brain also is, is uh, ignited and, and really important for them during these, these years. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes, social media, which is a huge challenge. And you think about the addiction part of it and how it, the, and any rewards that they might be getting. And that might be some, a cycle that, that starts off during these years. So often, so giving them, giving parents the, and caregivers the, the information around all of this to help them again with understanding, not excusing their behaviors, but can provide some insight and also hopefully provide some hope for them as well that this, this is something that is common, it's typical and can also be shifted as they age, but really having to remind them of the grace and patience that is needed. Thank you all for sharing.
all teens have a desire to be heard, listened to, taken seriously, and respected. I like to remind parents of walking the middle path. It's a skill from, the, from DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And under this is the six levels of validation. So paying attention, reflect, state the unstated, validate based on history, normalize, and be genuine. You may not necessarily have to do all six of these, but even if it's one or two, to be able to have a more, a, a more deeper connection with them. Validate to improve the relationships versus re being able to engage in a power struggle. When you validate, you reduce the power struggle and you move the focus on deciding on who is right and who is wrong. And also you can encourage parents to use behavioral strategies to increase and decrease behaviors through positive and negative reinforcement. So you can remind parents to, to highlight something that perhaps you can catch them being good, catch them doing something that you really enjoyed and use some positive reinforcement with that. It could be something along the lines of an I statement. I feel grateful that you spent some time with me at home watching this show together or I appreciate that you spent some time with me. Uh, I know you really wanted to spend some time with your friends to really acknowledge what they're doing, even if it seems small, it goes a long way. I also like to share with parents the example of being able to, it's like if they can imagine holding, say a ladybug in your hand, you don't wanna squeeze your hand really tight because a ladybug may not, survive. You may want to enjoy the ladybug, but if you open your hand too wide, the ladybug flies away. But if you cup your hand with the ladybug, it's free to move around in your hand. It won't fly away just yet, but it's also, you know, not in any danger. So in this way, you're walking the middle path with them and you're able to cup them and give them some, you're, you're of course not holding them tightly, but you're holding them lightly. Parents or caregivers can be the first ones to really say something that really stings. I was in a session with a client of mine who identifies as Mexican American, and she had mentioned, mothers will be the first one to say to you that you did something wrong. So you can provide parents with these examples. Instead of saying, what's wrong with you? You can help have them ask, what happened? Or what's going on? Another example is, instead of saying, don't worry about your friends, just focus on your studies. Have, you can have them say, it sounds like what's been happening for you with your friends has been, on, has, a lot of it has been happening on your mind and it's making it hard to focus on school. So there's the validation and the, and the reflection for them. And to, it can also help with opening the conversation. There's less of that power struggle and more of the likelihood that after discussing this, children or teens will be able to then refocus with the support of their parent. So next I want to share a case study I am using a pseudonym to maintain confidentiality. So we have Sylvia, a 15-year-old Colombian female in the 10th grade, experiencing severe depression, suicidal ideation, and self-harming behaviors to individual therapy by the school social worker. Sylvia and her mother immigrated in 2010 from Colombia. Sylvia recalled being promised a smooth transition to the United States, but instead she experienced fear, discomfort, and separation from her mother for three hours upon arrival. The trauma from her migration journey impacted her sleep and ability to focus on school, an important value in her family. And I want to also highlight that Sylvia had straight A's when she was in school in Colombia. In addition to individual sessions, Sylvia received medication management and family therapy. 
She was also psychiatrically hospitalized due to disclosing active thoughts of suicide and engaging in self-harm two months after beginning treatment. What are some warning signs that Sylvia was exhibiting? You can please use the chat feature to share. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> A non suicidal self injury, self ideation, suicidal ideation. Yes, difficulty with sleep. Yeah, sleep issues, decreased school performance. Thank you. Yes, we can, can imagine, yes, the, the difficulties with even concentration in school. Trauma of separation, absolutely. Self-injury, ideation, sleep deprivation, lower grades, yep. And what might be areas for follow-up with Sylvia's mother, given the barriers to participating in mental health services within the Latinx community? thinking about her experiences, yep, new to the country, insurance, language, absolutely. Yes, cultural migration, right, psychoeducation. Providing Sylvia's mother with psychoeducation around mental health, how this could be of support for her and her family. Yes, time, great. Walking alongside Sylvia's mother and providing that, that information and, and giving her her space and time to process all of this, to gain trust and gain rapport. Hmm. Maybe idealizing what reunification may be like and not understanding her daughter's traumatic experiences. Yes, for sure. And even throughout the, the time, what she might have expected her, her daughter's uh, transition to be like, what her, she expected her life to be like as well here in the United States. Validating that, that peer support. Yes, absolutely, making some space, empathizing with asking, about how the transition may have affected mom and the entire family. Thank you, Cynthia. Absolutely. Great. Being able to acknowledge that this isn't just Sylvia's experience, this isn't just Sylvia's mother's experience as well. The family was impacted. Being able to make space for all of that, to acknowledge, to, to talk about the trauma. In a, in a safe space. Thank you all. So one of my strategies was to help support Sylvia's mother as well. And with Sylvia's permission, I worked closely with her mother to gain her trust. I met with her mother for parent sessions, I provided phone call check-ins, validated her experiences, and offered resources for her and her family within their community. Sylvia, her mother, and I continued to work together until she graduated high school. Throughout the three years of treatment uh, through individual, parent, and family therapy, which persisted, the goal to improve Sylvia's mental health by learning about mental health as well as Sylvia's triggers and coping strategies, safety planning, and communicating effectively with each other. So we were really able to target a lot of parts of the brain that Sylvia was, uh, was experiencing some challenges with. Sylvia was able to improve her mental health, graduate high school, and attend a community college. So on the topic of self-care, which is a strategy that I helped 
Sylvia's mother as well with identifying and, and implementing as well. You know, we, we see that it is important for, for caregivers and, uh, and parents to take care of themselves because they're often caring for others. You know, and it is, while it is perhaps uncommon and maybe not encouraged to take care of yourself, it's encouraged to take care of others first but we can see the, the challenges with that. So some examples that you can provide uh, self-care, uh, sorry, caregivers to do in, in terms of their self-care are sleep. So however, as, as much as possible, whether it's seven or eight hours, but also the quality of sleep as well. So hygiene, making sure that they're taking care of themselves, making sure that they, can do things such as making time to shower, making some time to, as well as nutrition, to eat something that can be nutritious, can help fuel them as well. Hydration as well is important. Exercise, it doesn't have to be something that takes hours long. It could be as little as 10 minutes going for a walk, moving around their home in whatever ways it can be possible. Mindfulness is also something that can be done uh, for parents individually. It can also be done as, uh, as a family, something that can be modeled together and that they can work through to help reduce stress, anxiety, depression, and other emotions that they might be experiencing. You can help them to stay informed by being in contact with school personnel. Perhaps there's at least one person who they can form a relationship with and be in contact with to be able to have a presence in the school community. If they are practicing uh, any religion or spiritual, you can acknowledge and encourage them to continue on with that, whether it's going to church regularly, prayer or meditation. And then of course, as we've discussed, mental health care, whether it is their own individual therapy, maybe it's family or perhaps it's group therapy or any other support group as well. And then of course, community support. Remind caregivers that people need people. Again, this is a collectivist culture. We can certainly work through encouraging them to rely on others that can be of good support to them. And as I mentioned earlier, by the cultural norm may be to think of others first. You can support parents by reminding them that they must put their oxygen mask on first. And this is their best way of how they can be there for others. You can help them in checking in for any mental health clinics that are in their area for their own individual therapy. And community health clinics often provide affordable health care to people who might be otherwise, who might not have access to it otherwise. And these clinics are often community led as well and staffed by people who have experience and expertise in providing culturally responsive care. You can also help them identify any community-based organizations that have other events, um, whether it's direct support or engaging activities, again, within their community that they can be a part of and that can help with the acculturation process. When meeting with a provider, it can be helpful to ask questions to get a sense of their level of cultural awareness. You can help caregivers or parents in seeking community support by providing or giving a few questions that they can ask when meeting with a provider. So to get a sense of their level of cultural awareness, they can ask to this provider, have you treated other Hispanic Latinx people? Have you received training in cultural competence or on Hispanic Latinx mental health? How do you see our cultural backgrounds influencing our communication and my treatment? And if they seek primary help from a primary care doctor or a mental health professional, you wanna encourage them to feel heard and respected by the professional that they're working with. So they may ask to themselves, did I feel heard? Or did I feel my provider understood my concerns? Did my provider communicate effectively with me? Is my provider willing to integrate my beliefs, practices, identity, and cultural background into my treatment plan? 
Did I feel like I was treated with respect and dignity? Do I feel my provider understands and relates well with me? And these are certain questions that they can ask of providers. You as provider, as a provider as well, can reflect on this in working with them. Or you could also ask them directly so that they are empowered to give you feedback or to reflect on this as well. Some self-care strategies that you, know, you all as providers of Latinx families can also incorporate because your mental health and self-care matters too. So here are some examples. So there's a physical domain, which includes sleep, nutrition, exercise, again, in any way that you can. It doesn't have to be hours long, even if it's five, 10 minutes, getting your body moving is a good support for mood regulation. Health promotion visits, so such as your annual checkups, scheduling your lunch, really scheduling it in as best as possible. So that way there's a higher chance of it happening. You, know, you wouldn't cancel on your high risk client. So as best as possible, you, you don't wanna also cancel on yourself. Perhaps if you're interested in dancing, that's also another form of movement and ways to get some physical activity in. And then yes, trying to see, see if there's any possibilities to sleep seven to eight hours a night. Psychologically, so whether it's playing music, doing puzzles, attending and going to therapy and or support groups, going to your own supervision, practicing mindfulness, self-reflection or journaling, emotional, taking some deep breaths, taking moments throughout your day as best as possible to do so, talking to someone that you trust and practicing gratitude. And then also on the spiritual domain, this is something that resonates with you as well, whether it's prayer, connection to the universe or the earth, hiking, meditation, on relationships, enlarging your social network by attending personal and professional activities, calling loved ones, or scheduling a lunch or coffee with friends. Again, scheduling it in so that it, there's a higher chance of it happening, less of a chance of you having to cancel. And then professionally, whether it is networking, attending your own supervision, attending conferences or trainings, reading books or articles or journals on a skill that you're interested in. Self-care is not just about doing things to, to have fun or relax. These activities should help you with strengthening your ability to manage any difficult emotions that you experience. And these things can of course be done during the work hours in best ways that it can be incorporated. So here are some resources that you can share with parents and there are links uh, on, the, on the slides as well that you can access. So Mental Health America National has screening tools that are also available in Spanish. We can help parents, you can also do with them or provide them the link where they can also do their screening to assess for any mental health conditions such as depression or anxiety. There's also therapy for Latinx where you can find a provider or therapist who identifies as Latinx. Similarly, there's Latinx therapy. And then NAMI's Compartiendo Esperanza, they have a mental wellness area as well that focuses on the Hispanic and Latin American community. And here are the references as well, and there are links provided for you all if you are interested in reading further. And I just wanna thank you all for participating, for being here today. I want to take a moment to check in if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please feel free to type into the chat box. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so folks, please feel free to chat in um, any questions that you may have. Um, so I do want to thank you, um, Stephanie, for sharing some of that information with you. Um, and in terms of uh, some of the questions that we have, um, 
So uh, given what's happening at the border with uh, migrating families, uh, how can we help children and families who have experienced at times life-threatening situations, right? So children are scared to, to speak up, mm -hmm. uh, caregivers may not believe them or may not be sort of really recognizing the mental health issues. It's more about the physical necessities at that moment in time, or they may be going mm -hmm. through their own things, right? So right. I'm thinking, you know, along the lines of engagement and, and trust building. And I know someone um, earlier on commented in, in your scenario, right, that trauma of separation, mm -hmm. separation, and maybe grief of a home country, that grief and loss of having Fam, you know, family and, and friends, how in, in the particular social cultural context that we're in right now, what are some things that providers either need to be aware of and, and maybe help to sort of encourage or be encouraged to do with this unique population? Right. Absolutely. So much going on there. It's such a great question. You know, I want to start off with saying, acknowledging that this can be a process. This can take time. And there are, you thinking about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and thinking about shelter, clothing, food, ways that they can be connected to access uh, to these needs. And, you know, that is also a way to gain trust and being patient with the process as well as a provider yourself, but also with, with their own internal process, uh, supporting them and seeing and within the community, uh, where are some of the community-based organizations that are providing free resources, um, whether it is free mental health uh, services or um, a support group, or are giving uh, additional resources such as like food, clothing on a more consistent basis too. And thankfully living in New York City, we have access to a lot of those resources and um, being able to connect them to these resources can be a great help, but also validating their experiences. You know, we don't want to say, don't be scared, you're, you're in good hands, right? We don't, we don't want to dismiss what they're going through. Yes, they can be in good hands, um, but they are having so many emotions and it could be so flooding to them. So being able to validate them, you know, similarly to what we were talking about earlier with walking the middle path, validating the teen, but also validating the family, even if it means directly to the caregiver. There's so much that they're going through and the trauma of being separated from your home country and your family and where you grew up and whatever conditions you, they were able to escape from as well. And thinking about Sylvia's experience and how, you know, we hear so many stories like this where they were promised a smooth ride to the United States and they get the complete opposite. And it's so heartbreaking, so devastating to hear about this and to imagine what they've gone through. So also keeping that in mind um, and whenever appropriate with time, of course, see if they would be willing to share that to be able to work through the traumatic experience. Great, thank you. And you know, I do appreciate the resources that you shared, right? Because earlier on, we also did have someone or a couple of folks, you know, say that some of the barriers might be that there is a lack of representation within the mental health field. Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciate your resources where if that is something that an individual, that a youth, a family feels more comfortable with, then how can we provide those reference or those resources so they can find someone um, that they feel more comfortable in? Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, there's a couple of questions coming in. Um, we do have um, one that just came in. Do you have any strategies when the parent is supplying alcohol, mm -hmm. for example, during quinceanera as their cultural norm uh, to help them recognize that this is not appropriate or legal. So I think also the sort of this mismatch, right, with our sort of cultural norms and then another country or it might be considered legal or, or illegal, right? But that that's how we celebrate, right? There's there's celebration that's very rich in, in the Latinx culture. So how do you balance that? Right. That's such a great question. And yes, like we see and hear about that and in this uh of course, like Quinceañera is being recognized as this, you know, milestone in their lives where they're, you know, becoming closer to being adults and, but yet not adults as well. And that's the part where you can, in, in a gentle fashion, acknowledge that for the parents that while you, there, there is this, a cultural piece, there's also, you know, tying it back to the psychoeducation, how alcohol can, and, and any other substances as well can impact their developing brain. 
and how you know we want to be able to, of course, speak with the the, the teens as well around what how to make better decisions uh, for themselves, uh, but also as a parent to to be able to model that and to uh, share rather with the with the child or teen how to make uh, better decisions. So yes, it's definitely a fine line between you know what's culturally appropriate, but also all the while it's not uh, not appropriate and and not legal as well here. Um, so definitely balance between the two, like acknowledging that, but also giving some information that can help with giving with providing uh, better decisions. Thank you, and I'm I'm thinking now of that the the larger larger uh, filled out diagram, right, from the teenage and for a quinceanera, you know, mm -hmm. um, a 15 year old girl yeah. or, or anyone else in in that sort of time frame, right? Um, how do you um, do what what is expected within your culture, but then also understanding what's happening in that teenage brain, right? So I think some of us also might learn visually, so to maybe even have that and, and pull that out for caregivers. And like you were saying, whether it's alcohol or any other sort of substances or, or any other topic per se, right? We as a caregiver may not fully understand how it might be interpreted um, right. from the perspective of a teenage brain. So maybe even sharing that as a resource might help to sort of provide a little bit more context around that, um, sort of smooth that messaging um, between balancing what's expected in my culture, what's culturally you know, what's, what's a cultural norm and, and maybe what would maybe might not fly Absolutely. here per se. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Um, so how, or, or what can you say to caregivers that are reluctant to engage in some therapeutic approaches such as mindfulness? Um, so there might be stressors, but they don't want to be told stop and breathe. Right. And I think we see this with sort of a younger generation that they're much more open, you know, through TikTok or whatever else, right? Like these mindfulness experiences. Um, but when you have older generations, and as you were talking beforehand, right, sort of keeping things behind closed doors, how do we maybe chip away not only to just engage the youth in that, but also to bring that caregiver along? Um, and for some of these therapeutic processes that may not be what they're looking for, right? I know you spoke about um, the hierarchy of needs, but how can we maybe sort of help people engage in, in maybe some of these uh, therapeutic approaches? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, mindfulness is is something that I know has been tossed around often, and you know, some may say, "Oh, it doesn't work for me," or "I tried it and I couldn't," um, or they're just not interested. And and then there are those who are and have been, you know, able to be consistent with it, and, it, and they can see the benefits of it. You know, when you can, on one hand, you know, you can share with them any of the, like the research behind it to see, you can even share on the topic of brain imaging, um, you can share with them images of ways that people have improved areas of their brain um, when they practice meditation or mindfulness um, versus those who don't. And you can see how areas like certain parts can um, can light up certain parts start to like certain gray areas are no longer in that way they start to see improvement in their brain functioning as a result of practicing mindfulness more consistently uh, but also even if there could be some ways to engage the parent as a whole like there could be uh, ways that family members can connect and further uh, their connection with each other by engaging in mindfulness. Perhaps it could be even done within a family session, maybe at the beginning of the session and or the end of the session. And they can use that moment to process. You know, it's often challenging when you, you tell them to do something and you, they take it home and they may forget. But if you practice, take about one or two minutes to practice it together, they can start to, they open that door and they can see what it's like. And so being able to to practice it can help with being able to be more open to it mm -hmm. and you know all the while too respecting that if they're not open to it right like we don't want to engage in that power struggle too and um, you can provide us information and of course practice it with them whenever uh, it may be appropriate and then trying to see what how else this can be incorporated great thank you and you know someone to just chime in right it's so it's not the breathe in to four, hold, breathe out, right? Smell the flowers, blow out the candles, right? How can we maybe change some of the language so that it can maybe 
move away from the particular model that we might be used to. Um, so I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, I did want to see if we could squeeze this question in. Um, can you speak? Can you please speak to the challenges or crises that may arise at the intersection of the development or emergence of multiple identities, such as sexual orientation, gender uh, identity, for example, and culture in supporting and uh, cultural and supporting caregivers? So maybe sometimes when there there might be some issues or, or struggles there as yeah. you know teenagers are developing and finding out who they are. Right. Yes, such an important question. And, you know, all the while more and more this is being discussed. And I um, appreciate that question. I I would say, you know, yes, it's something that we can see often. And, you know, even within um, the Hispanic Latinx community, you know, there's, of course, like talk about mental health stigma. And then also when it comes to the LGBTQ Less community as well, and and the, any like stigma around that or, or closeness that are around that, um, and it's hard to ignore, right? That is something that is very valid, very real for the teenagers who are developing and trying to explore. And you know, I've had experiences where there are parents who are completely closed off and don't want to talk about it, and then having some that, of course, are open to it, and then some of them that are in the middle where some denial about it, but wanting to work through it. And, you know, and, and similarly, you know, being able to walk with the parents around this, uh, the refusal to talk about it, to, to be open about it. Um, you know, we can offer some resources as well, whether it's through a worksheet um, or uh, um, organizations around the city. It might also be helpful to offer books as well that are around supporting your child who may be questioning or exploring or identifying, you know, or uh, transitioning. So there's a lot of um, books for parents uh, because it is common. And I think the other piece too is to validate, again, going back to validating um, and normalizing to um, towards parents that this is common, um, this can be a challenge. There's a lot, um, you know, talk about losses that they might be experiencing, the idea of who they thought their child would be um, and who their child is or is becoming and being able to offer those resources, you know, whether it is a book or, um, you know, or uh, organizations or clinics, or maybe it is a community-based um, organization that can further support, even if it's through their own individual therapy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, there's, there's so much even just coming out of that question, right? When we talk about sort of the cultural aspect, but then also religion for the most part tends to be also very, um, a, a very strong place, uh, a role um, in upbringing in households and primarily for caregivers. So yeah, definitely a lot um, there. So, um, you know, we are just about at time. Um, I do want to thank you, Stephanie, for answering those questions and for um, such an informative presentation. As a reminder, folks, um, you know, the slides will be up on our CTAG webpage within the next two to three days. Um, on our next slide, I do want to invite you to join us for our upcoming events. There's also um, a survey link that my colleague Vanessa just put in the chat box for you. So uh, please take the time to fill out that survey. We do take a, a, the time to look at them and get additional information as to what uh, future um, webinars might be of interest to you and really help support you in the work that you're doing to really help children, youth, and families. Um, so again, you know, there's a link in your chat box. Please take the time to do that. Um, and just very lastly, I do want to thank you, Stephanie, um, for folks on our very last slide, you know, um, there's the webpage for our, um, um, our webpage address for any past and current offerings. Uh, please log in or email us if you have any questions. Again, the survey link is in your chat box. Um, but, you know, just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. And on behalf of CTAC and Stephanie, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.